Welcome. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of short videos about um, the regulators concerned with charities. Um, my name is James Sinclair Taylor. I'm one of the partners in the charity and social business team at uh, Russell Cook. And I'm going to be talking to Rachel McCastman um, about the issues relating to serious incidents. Serious incidents are a big issue with the Commission and getting them wrong for a charity can have serious consequences. And whether it's getting them wrong by not doing them when they should or doing them in the wrong way, all of these can have consequences. But the first key thing is to identify what is a serious incident. Rachel, what can you tell us about that? So it's actually quite interesting kind of the origin of where serious incidents come from. So there's a specific section in some regulations made by the Charity Commission, which says that if your charity has an income of over £25,000, then you have to state in your annual return whether there were any serious incidents in that year that you hadn't reported. Now, if we look then at the Charity Commission's guidance on serious incidents, it says that all charities have to do these, so it doesn't matter what your income is. It has to be done without delay, so not just at the end of the year. You have to give a full and frank disclosure about what's happened, and you have to also say how you're dealing with the issue. So we can see that that goes quite a lot further than what those regulations say, and it's quite a good example of how the distinction between you know, charity law and charity best practice can sometimes become a bit blurred. But I think for the purpose of this conversation and for people who are listening from charities, the key thing is that you, you're expected by your regulator to report serious incidents in detail and without delay. And we would advise you to make those reports because as James said, there can be some kind of serious risks if you don't do that. So what you're saying is that trustees effectively promise at the end of the year when they send, sign the annual return that they have fully complied with their obligation to report serious incidents. Yeah, exactly. So what exactly is a serious incident? So what counts as a serious incident? So there's a specific test in the Charity Commission's guidance, um, which is essentially it's an adverse event that falls into one of four categories. So the first category is there's been harm caused to someone who's come into contact with your charity. So this is essentially a safeguarding incident under the wider definition of what the Charity Commission says safeguarding covers. So anyone who comes into contact with your charity rather than just you know, children and vulnerable adults. Um, so a good example of that will be, you know, I think this is given in their guidance as well. If a, you know, you've got an external review of your charity that has found that there's widespread bullying in your charity. So that's an example of something that falls within that first, um, first section. Um, the second type is if there's been any loss of money or assets. So that could be things like theft or fraud, um, but it could also be something like loss of a key funding contract if that's significant. The third thing is if there's been any damage to the charity's property. So, for example, a fire at your premises or something like that. And then the fourth thing is if there's been any harm to your charity's work or its reputation. So this is a really key issue for the Commission and something that we've talked about in a previous one of these videos. But essentially, if there's any bad press about your charity or you've got any kind of inkling that there's going to be some bad press, you should be thinking about whether you need to make a serious incident report. Now, serious incidents can be things that have actually already happened. They can be things where there's a risk that it could have happened, something that's been you know, alleged that it happened. So even if you're still investigating, you should be making a report to the commission if you think it's a serious incident. Um, you can update the reports later, but the commission's preference is that you do the report initially and then update it later if you need to. And then a key part of the test is that it has to be significant. So this incident has to be significant in the context of your charity. So that's taking into account your staff, your operations, your finances, your reputation. So to give you an example of that, if you're a charity with an income of you know, £300,000 a year and you lose £50,000, that's pretty significant. But if your income's millions of pounds, that's not so significant. So, so that does come into the kind of consideration of what's serious or not. Now, I realise there's a lot there that I've just talked through. Um, so, you know, the Charity Commission does have some quite detailed guidance on its website. Um, it's got an examples table of the kinds of things that it thinks are and aren't reportable. Um, and also, if you're you know, struggling with any particular issue or concerned about anything, um, me and James are obviously always very happy to chat through that with you. And I think one of the issues that's difficult for charities is that although the duty to report these incidents has been going for about five years, the rules have changed quite a bit in that time. 
and people now have to report a rather different set of things as serious than they did when the whole process started. So you've got to stay up to date with not only the actual published uh, documentation of the Commission, but actually where their key sensitivities are from time to time. And we've talked about that in, in earlier sessions. So how do trustees actually make sure that this happens and that they find out about these incidents? So I think the key thing is making people aware about serious incidents. So whether it's your staff or if you don't have staff, making sure that trustees are all aware. So whether you do that through inductions, through training, through having policies, it's about making sure that people know how to recognize a serious incident, know how to escalate it to the right person, and really importantly, know that they should be doing that quickly. So as I mentioned earlier, the Charity Commission expects you to report serious incidents promptly. And what it says that means in its guidance is as soon as possible after it happens or immediately after you become aware of it. Now, in practice, often there is a little bit of a delay because, you know, you need to maybe get legal advice before submitting it, for example. But you should, if there is any kind of delay, you should be able to justify that because really you should be reporting it promptly. So, what that tells us is that having, you know, quarterly trustee meetings where you get reports from the staff isn't going to be enough to pick up on these incidents in time. So, you know, you really need to be delegating responsibility for managing serious incidents to the CEO, for example, um, and having appropriate policies in place to support that delegation. Because as trustees, you are ultimately responsible. And um, so you need to be confident that it is actually, you know, these issues are being identified and dealt with properly. Yes, I think that delegation point is very important. And we would normally suggest that at least one trustee was involved in reporting these because as trustees, we're all um, particularly here to protect the reputation of a charity and handling a serious incident report carefully is a really important reputation management tool. So um, how do charities that work in high risk areas um, get serious incidents happening all the time deal with this? Yeah, so it's, it's you know, the, the sad answer is that you do have to report them all, um, which I know probably some people watching will be disappointed by because it is quite a big task if you, you know, if you work in an overseas jurisdiction or if you work in an area with children or adults at risk, you're going to have a lot of safeguarding incidents, for example. So you do have to report them all, but the Charity Commission does recognise that some charities are in this situation. So you can ask the Charity Commission whether you can submit bulk reports to them, which means that rather than doing a separate report for every single incident that happens, you do a kind of spreadsheet or whatever it might be. But that spreadsheet must still include kind of enough information for them to understand what's happened but it saves a little bit of the admin time that you've got to go through. So what happens if you don't report a serious incident? So if you don't report and the Charity Commission later finds out about it so you know there might be a complaint about it or they might read something in the media the trustees are really going to need to be able to explain why it wasn't reported at the time and that's especially the case if you have ticked that box in the annual report which says that there were no serious incidents during the year. Um, there is a risk in that situation that the Charity Commission says that there's been mismanagement by the trustees because of a failure to report. So what I'd say is that, you know, it is really important to get this right. And possibly one of the most important things in that situation is having clear minutes. So if you've decided not to report something, make sure that you're really, really clearly documenting why you've made that decision, what factors you took into account, be really clear that you kind of read and considered the guidance. Because then if that situation does come up, you can show all of that to the Charity Commission and they're less likely um, to think that, you know, you've mismanaged the charity. And it's interesting, the Commission is getting more digital and one of the things they're doing is looking at charities and seeing whether they've reported what might be expected as a reasonable number of serious incidents, given what they do, and they may come to you and say, you don't appear to be a, uh, reporting as many incidents as your peer charities. Why aren't you? And that can be a very disturbing thing to happen to people. Um, is there any risk that having reported something which could obviously have reputational implications, uh, this could be made public um, by the Commission, either voluntarily or as a result of a freedom of information request from perhaps a, a reporter? It's a very easy way to get a good story. Absolutely. Um, and the Charity Commission's guidance is explicit in saying we don't guarantee that this will be kept confidential. Um, 
I mean, the freedom of information point, in theory, it's possible. Um, there are exemptions under that legislation. So situations where a public body doesn't have to disclose something. I've never personally heard of anything being disclosed. But if anyone who's watching this has heard something, I'd be really interested to hear, you know, how that happened. Um, the, the, the thing I'd say is to include kind of the minimum identifying information that you can while still making a clear report to the commission. So that's both for confidentiality reasons, but also for kind of data minimization under data protection rules. So that's something to keep in mind. And um, the other thing to mention is that if the commission opens an inquiry into your charity off the back of a serious incident report, which does sometimes happen, um, they will publish a summary of the incident on their website. So short answer, yes, um, unfortunately it is possible. And I have to say, my, from personal experience as a trustee, uh, having uh, been involved in a charity that made a serious incident, uh, the um, Charity Commission res uh, responded to a press inquiry as to whether there were any serious incidents of this sort, and they made a full disclosure to it with lasting damage to the reputation of the charity. So I think the proactive thing to do about that is to explain um, in your uh, serious incident report, and it's one of the things we always add when we're helping people with serious incident reports, why it would be damaging to the charity. And secondly, of course, to recognise that even if you do that, there still may be a leak or disclosure of some sort, and to develop a proactive uh, programme uh, of media management to deal with uh, any adverse reputational impact. So uh, how should... Um, charities submit reports and is there a recommended approach to this? So there's an online form that the Charity Commission requires you to use if you want to submit a report. So that's relatively new. I think it used to be that you could write a letter, but now there's this standard form you have to use. And that has some specific questions in it, depending on what type of incident you're reporting, etc. cetera. Um, the key thing in terms of approach is to be able to kind of say to the Commission, look, this has happened, but we've acted really swiftly to respond to it. You know, here's our action plan of how we're going to deal with the problem. You know, we've taken appropriate advice from professionals. Um, and if you can come to them with that, that kind of a report, then they're much less likely to take further action because they can see that you're managing it properly. Whereas if you do a report saying, oh gosh, this has happened, you know, that's it, then you're much more likely to be at risk of a regulatory compliance case being opened. Well, thank you for that, Rachel. This is a serious and important area, and um, it is really important for all of uh, the organisations out there to to take this duty seriously because it's one the commission is taking very seriously indeed so thank you all and goodbye goodbye